Hello, hello, hello. <coughs> ah, hello. Hey, how you guys doing? What's up? Hello, hello, hello. Oh man, it is Monday. It is March. It is now time to bust a recap. Oh my god, I, I totally, I totally messed that one up, didn't I? Yeah, look at that. Okay, yeah, that's a lot better. Hey. How you guys doing out there? This is Solar Gray, the Cinematic Sorcerer, and I am here to bust a bit of a recap with you. No, I didn't silence my phone. I didn't do that whole thing. Ah, yo, you guys, you guys, how you guys doing today? As you guys got in the announcement, I didn't put out um, the big explosive Instagram and Twitter and Facebook and tags and all that stuff. Because in all honesty, I was going to take today off. I, I really was. I'm not feeling that great. No, it is not the coronavirus. At least I don't think it is. But um, no, what I'm feeling right now is a lot more internal stuff. Stuff hit me here in the feels today. And um, I just wanted to remember that I got some integrity issues. And by that, I mean... I have integrity so instead of staying in bed all day and just watching YouTube videos of um, Warner Brothers cartoons from the 1920s I decided to get up and come to work and that's what I did so that, that's what I'm doing um, I'm gonna give you guys the best I got today and it might not be as good as normally but who knows um, maybe I'll be able to reach a couple of people uh, before we get started with that, I would really like it if you guys sent me an email um, or two emails, maybe three emails or something, um, and did all the social networking stuff. So while we're doing all that jazz, what I'm going to do is I'm going to turn the music back up and there we go. Yeah, I'm going to turn the music back up and say... Drop us an email at backinthedeck at gmail.com. That's B-A-C-K-I-N-T-H-E-D-E-C-K at gmail.com. Hit us up on the social medias, just be it Instagram or Twitter, uh, dot com slash backinthedeck. Hit up our Patreon. Uh, join Deckers on the on the book. Do all that jazz. And, you know, communicate with us. Hit, up, hit us up. Let us know what's going on with you. Ask me questions. I'll be happy. Like, I want to take a segment where I start answering emails, but you guys don't send me anything to read, so that's fine. Um, so today, I wanted to talk to you guys about this show, specifically Buster Recap. Because, um, you know, I've been looking at the analytics and all that jazz, and a lot of people are like, ah, quit, blah, 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 blah. And I get it. I, I get that a lot of people do bunches of stuff. And I wanted to talk talk with you guys about what it's like picking things to do on the internet. Um, that's a big thing. That is a really, really big thing. And it's something that evidently I'm not good at. So here is the thing. I'm not asking for advice. Um, I'm not asking for people's suggestions. I'm just letting you know what the process is. If you guys do have any if you guys want to converse with me about it, do it in emails, not in comments, because I don't debate things in public because people tend to want to debate for theater and not to find solutions. Um, one of the channels I watch is actually Destiny on YouTube, and he likes to find solutions, but the people that he argues with are only arguing ideology. That's just the time that we're at in the 21st century, and I don't engage with it which is why we don't talk like serious hardcore politics on this channel back in the deck isn't about that um but but i do want to tell you guys about why i pick the shows i pick now there is this thing that my mom used to call keeping up with the joneses and that is seeing what your neighbors are doing and then having to do the same thing now growing up in the ghetto in the 80s, that manifested with leather jackets like Run DMC, and of course, shoes. Always shoes. Somebody's got to be the first on the block to get the new pair of Nikes, and whoever didn't get the new pair of Nikes ended up being prey. Um, I grew up with that in my regular paradigm, and that's something that I don't want to carry into my adult life. Um, and so I make a living on the internet, 
sort of. <laughs> yeah. So what are we doing? Well, what we're going to talk about today is why I chose Lost in Space and Harley Quinn. Um, in truth, there's a lot of things that are out there. Okay. And one of the hottest topics that were out there, biggest things, was The Witcher on Netflix, right? Like, oh my God, everybody's doing videos on The Witcher. Everyone is watching The Witcher. And that is sort of the bread and butter of the internet at that point. Right now, people are covering the election um, because it's March 2020, so it's a presidential year. Um, matter of fact, Super Tuesday for the 2020 election is tomorrow. So that's a hot topic. But the thing is, I'm not a reporter. I'm, I'm not a topical um, journalist. Um, so to continuously chase the hot thing um, is something that is extra work for me. Writing these episodes, making sure I'm healthy enough to talk for an hour to 90 minutes to sometimes two, three hours. Um, that is in itself a job. And to chase down these topics since I don't have a research department I don't have um, college kids that are hunting down stuff giving me bullet points and things like that like a lot of these other channels do um, no nothing wrong with that no this ain't this ain't a hate thing I, I don't spew that kind of hate um, I just don't have those resources so I'm not going to chase all of that around I spent a lot of years with this channel chasing what people told me they would watch only to find out that they were lying and when i say lying they don't watch today um and there's 150 different excuses and i'm like you know what i've done the universities i've done the internet research and i'm like you know what i'm just gonna do what i like and i'm betting i'm betting i'm actually betting like my rent that there are people out there that are just like me that like the stuff that i like and I would rather build a community than chase the dollar. So why Lost in Space? Um, well, Lost in Space came out at the same time as The Witcher, okay? And The Witcher was the big hot tune. But here's something that you guys don't know about me, okay? I don't really follow video game properties because video games was a luxury that I didn't really have growing up. Um, I did what I could to become good at Street Fighter 2 when it first came out. Okay, I'm, I'm actually pretty decent at fighting games. Um, or should I say, I'm better than a lot of dads. You know, I'm better than a lot of 40-something year olds at video games and not as good as a lot of younger people. But the thing is, that's not what my life revolves around. Um, back in my day, there was the Atari 2600, all right? And we begged and begged and begged and we just didn't have the money, you know, just that, that just didn't have the money, couldn't find the money. That was it. We didn't have it. Um, I didn't get my first computer until the 90s and the computer I got didn't even have a graphic user interface, but it was the only one that we could afford. So you guys out there that like live, breathe and die on the Internet, um, you guys came from a place of higher privilege than I had. Um, this is important because I can tell you the stories about when the Nintendo, the Nintendo Entertainment System or the NES hit the market. I was witness to those store riots. I was witness to those parents fighting each other over um, who got the last Nintendo Entertainment System and it wasn't my family. We didn't have it. I had a cousin that had one at one point. Um, but that was it. And that cousin lived like 20 miles away, you know? Um, and later on, I had a friend and I talked about him on another show, but I'm going to keep his name anonymous who had a Nintendo and he had a Sega, a Sega Genesis. And later on, he had a, um, 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 a super NES primarily because he was, um, he was handicapped. Um, he had a major case of cerebral palsy and computers were his thing and he had support from both of his parents um, to learn computers and he also had a disability check that came in every month on top of what his mom made to maintain the house. So he had his own money to buy stuff 
at an age where there was no work for anyone who was like 12. You know, the only work I could do was to do stuff for drug dealers and gangsters. And my mom let me know that if she ever found out that I was in a world of crime, she would shoot me in the face to keep me from being killed by cops that already see me as um, a bad guy and friends that didn't give a crap about me. I'm paraphrasing exactly what she said. She used more colorful language. So I'm doing these things. I had no money. The best I could do was gather up cans in the neighborhood, take them to the recycling place and stuff like all that. And I never had enough to save because another policy in my house was if you have any money of your own, you get no additional money. So um, if I could get like a dollar or two from recycling cans, a Nintendo Entertainment System cost $250 back then. So by the time I would get enough money for an NES or a Sega, the PlayStation would have been out. So I spent my money in the arcades and on candy because I was a fat kid. Um, so where does this put me? When we have these hot video game properties out there, I'm behind because the only video game system I had access to was when my roommate slash adopted brother got a play, um, got a PlayStation, the original PlayStation one all the way back in 1998. This is important because that was the last time that I had a video game system at my access. Now, the video game system interface, the controller, um, I was used to a directional pad and no more than four buttons. And now, by the time the PlayStation came out, we had this thing with triggers and all that stuff, and I was okay. But since the PlayStation and the Dreamcast came out, the hardware and controls and principles of video games have evolved. And if you weren't in it, then you're, you were going to fall behind. Um, so where am I at now? I'm behind and I really don't want to spend $4,000 on, um, a computer other than my editing bay, um, to learn or, you know, to have the good enough graphics card to prevent lag so I'm not frustrated because I'm shooting someone dead on and I'm still missing because there's lag and on video cards and on internet signals and all this other stuff like now currently I have the infrastructure to play games now that I have a podcasting studio but um what I don't have is the time I do not have the time to catch up with um you know, I don't have the time to catch up with people that are playing all these games. I'm like dead new to all this. So when it came to things like Batman Arkham City, um, um, the Prince of Persia series from the PlayStation 3, I think it was, um, and all this online gaming, I'm so far behind. It's going to take me three or five weeks or three or five three to five years to become a novice at these games and honestly that's just way too much frustration in order to get farther ahead than i am but to be behind everyone else so why didn't i choose the witcher well <laughs> it's simple i have no emotional stakes on on that show um i like henry cavill i do um he made me feel bad when he was superman because i knew while watching man of steel that i will never be superman i will never look like that granted um he was playing against a terrible script terrible script not very good actor direction and a terrible script so he kind of blew it as superman but this was my first real exposure to him i think i saw him in the clash of the titans movie um that came out in the early aughts but um you know i like him fine enough as an actor whatever but um as far as the witcher goes i didn't play the game i didn't know much about the property i hadn't read any of the books i didn't have the emotional connection um read passion 
for the project that anyone else had. Now this could have given me a good perspective on it, but this is the internet where everyone is known for weighing things out logically, speaking clearly, and never ever ever reverting to bullying tactics. To <laughs> I can't finish that. <laughs> I totally, I, I just can't finish it, I'm sorry. Um, so yeah, I didn't feel like the fight. I didn't feel like the fight. Um, now Lost in Space, as you guys know, if you watch this show regularly, you guys know I did have an emotional attachment to it. I did have a passion for it. Um, partly because of my childhood, because I don't care what anyone thinks, nostalgia is a fantastic spice. It really is. It makes so many things that aren't good really good after you've eaten them. Because, um, yeah, go back. Go back and watch Silverhawks from the 1990s or the original Thundercats. And if you can listen to Snarf for more than an episode and a half without wanting to gouge the eyes out of this animated character, then you're a better person than I am and I'll be, I'll be willing to reconsider my nostalgia thought. Um, but Lost in Space had it. Um, and I'm a little different from a lot of folks out there on the internet because of my cultural background and because of my age, okay? And this is what I want to talk about today. I want to talk about the uh, age and the cultural backgrounds. Um, I did not enjoy my childhood. I did not enjoy my past. My glory days came after college <laughs> um, when I was in my late um, late 20s, early 30s, and things have just gotten better for me since then. Um, not to say that there hasn't been struggles. Um, I have been known to break down and cry in public. There have been bouts of anger. I even had to go to the hospital a couple of times in my adult life for psychological reasons, okay? But this has been the best part of my life. So when I look at stuff from my past and things that I liked as a child, I can appreciate that I liked them back then and I don't need them preserved or crystallized. This is one of the reasons why I don't care about the new Star Wars franchise. Um, this is why I can look at a piece of media and say, you know what, I didn't like it, but I'm not mad at a lot of people who do, okay? Um, and as I get older, I find that people are more complicated, the stories that we tell are more complicated, and the ways that we tell these stories are more complicated. We've come a long way from Campfire Ghost Stories, y'all. We went from Campfire Ghost Stories to The Last of Us. I mean, seriously, you know. So it really is um, a difference in age and a difference in perspective, okay? Um, now... There are a few things that I see as an older man that a lot of people don't see. And much like when talking to a teenager, a lot of people might not be capable of understanding what you're talking about just because they have not lived long enough to understand the implications of what you're saying, or they have lived their experience so hard and so much that the idea of something other than their experience is foreign and uncomfortable, okay? Um, so again, why The Witcher? Well, um, I didn't play The Witcher, but it also came out at a time where I'm kind of tired of fantasy. I've been fantasied out for a while. Not that I dislike fantasy. I like fantasy very much. I like Tolkien-based fantasy very much. I'm not really big on elves. You know, it, 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 it's a thing. But um, between Dungeons and Dragons, Lord of the Rings, um, most fantasy shows that are based on those things, most fantasy games, like you know, there are more Dungeons & Dragons video games out there than you guys even know, or than a lot of you guys know, because seriously, every single Baldur's Gate, or Morrowind, or 
um, all this this is all based on Dungeons and Dragons properties which is all based on um, Tolkien fantasy which is based on European folklore okay this is European folklore and that has a weird brain effect to Americans okay um, I love European folklore in fact I love northern European folklore I do seriously like Ymir is one of my favorite mythological characters but I do tend to like the people who know everything that's just me that's my taste um you know and I like you know in Norse mythology I like that Odin is a very gray character not good not bad but complex um you know and there's there's a lot of that stuff that's out there however media now more than ever is written with the idea that the observer can insert themselves into the perspective of the character you always hear things like audience insert character it's the character in a movie that doesn't know what's going on and they say why why what's that i don't understand please exposit at me the world <laughs> you know um and the thing is since media for the past at least 15 years has been created in a bubble that says i want the viewer to see themselves as the main character um fantasy has not been a very good place for me and a lot of other people of color that i know because this is european fantasy and it's made for self-insertion but in the times of european folklore under the educational system of the united states the places for people that don't come from western europe um are very clear and defined as other and less and um even though the writers might not intend for that to be the effect the culture around the writer makes that very clear and i want to make i want to make something real clear i'm huge on identifying my stuff with the world around me i'm because as an adult as a grown man when i talk to people i gotta make sure i can say whoa 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 those are your issues those aren't my issues but in order to say that i have to be clear on what my issues are okay so I know when I take away my issues, I can see what's around, you know, I can really see what's around. And I've talked about this on a myriad of different shows. Um, on Dark Side of the Room, I talked about how um, players around me would only accept certain character types that I would play. Like when I played um, an educated British person, the answer was no, no one would interact with me. But as soon as I played Sam Jackson from Black Snake Moan, I became one of the most popular characters out there, you know. And if you want to argue and say like, yeah, well, he's a cool character and blah, blah, blah. Um, if that's the case, why did no one else out of this hundred person game want to play that character? Like, why did no one think of it before I did? OK, um, you know, so the, these are real things, like I said, when. I know what my issues are, but I can also identify the world around me that I live in. And there's a lot of it that's ugly. So when it comes to fantasy, you know, The Witcher is very much based on a series of novels that are based on, I believe, German folklore. So it's written with this idea of the reader can imagine themselves as The Witcher or as a character in that. But it's hard for me and other people that are not of that cultural um that cultural paradigm to insert themselves in and this is a very very regular american thing um it's one of the reasons that the black panther movie got so much pushback from so many people a couple of years ago because it was a mostly black cast and since it was a mostly black cast there were a good amount of white america that and, and they've said these things to me personally i didn't identify with the character so i wasn't interested i couldn't see myself in 
in the story. And oh my God, it was race baiting. These are all direct quotes that have been said to me. Um, and I realize that's anecdotal, but if you want to do the research, just read some of the reviews, go back and look at the trailers for Black Panther or some of the, some of the um, press releases of the black community's reaction to the um, Black Panther and read the comments, okay? Um, and you'll see, you'll see the internal struggle. Now, Lost in Space is science fiction. Okay. And science fiction was something that a lot of people that are unhappy with their lives look to for escapism. Fantasy is, but fantasy is a much smaller, uh, it, it, it's escapism on a smaller scope. Again, I love Dungeons and Dragons. I especially love 5th edition because they have incorporated black people into it. Um, you know, read the lesson, 7th C. Um, you know, they have incorporated an African type continent and, you know, they're normalizing the presence of people that aren't just Western European, which is cool. This is when there's all this talk about representation and all that stuff. What we're talking about is normalization. We shouldn't be looked at as something out of place because we're here and we've always been here. Sorry. I mean, you know. Uh, Chatwick Bozeman has um, a movie coming out about, I believe it's Kinjiru. Um, oh, God. I, I'm. Anyway, it's a tangent, but he was a black samurai. He was a samurai out of Africa who was accepted into the Japanese culture after some trials and tribulations, and he was made a servant of the people. So, you know, there were black samurais out there. There were, you know, Native Americans that pulled a whole lot of good stuff, or should I say First Nations people. Um, and Asians have, you know, influenced a whole bunch of stuff. And let's not forget things like math, the Baghdad battery, um, a good amount of foundations for um, moral behavior and most technology when it comes to surviving in the desert has come from the Middle East. There was a point where I believe it was Tel Aviv or somewhere that was the Paris of the East. It was a fantastic place. It's practically been glassed now, but you know, so on this planet, we've had an entire world of a whole lot of contributions, but those aren't things that are known to regular people via our education system, okay? Um, so when you deal with sci-fi, sci-fi is on a much grander scope. Even on the stories that are based on America, which was a huge contribution to science fiction, um, when it's coded American, there are still America as a global community in the Star Trek sort of way. And it's hard to talk about black, white, Asian, whatever, even LGBT. It's hard to speak negatively on those things in sci-fi because it asks the questions off planet do these rules still apply you know if you fall in love with an alien that's neither male nor female then where do you say your sexuality lies and why are we fighting over the brownness of my skin versus the tanness of someone else's skin when we've got red and green people out there that are quadrupeds that are all smarter than us like you know it, it, it's it's a larger question and it presents stories on a larger scope. It's also mostly based in alternative presence that have alternative past, alternate histories, or the far future. Um, most of the sci-fi that I read, and sci-fi comes in as many flavors as there are ice cream, I deal with wholesome speculative fiction. And by that, I mean I like looking at stuff in a future where we've gotten over all of our current issues and we've discovered other issues because we've left the planet. We've gone beyond this and we're looking at the different levels. Um, in all the Robert A. Heinlein books, sometimes he tackled racism head on, like in Farnham's Freehold. Um, but in other times, he's like, we're, it was, you know, <clears throat> um, in Double Star, that was a political book. Um, 
for um, talking about politics, um, negotiating a treaty between Earth and Mars, and Martians were alien. They had their own culture, and it was a real culture. It was a very well fleshed out one. In the future history series, um, he dealt with going deep, deep, deep into the future and then going back in the past and asking moral questions. So this was a lot of the stuff that he did. Um, Philip K. Dick used a lot of sci-fi to explore questions of the modern life and stuff. But when it just comes to sci-fi escapism, like Lost in Space or um, Star Wars to a certain point, or Star Trek on their filler episodes that weren't morality plays. Um, it's really easy. It's easy for me and it's easier for a lot of people to self-insert when the story is making you self-insert. Um, and that's big for me. That's really big for me. If, if the thing is written with the intention on self-insertion and I don't fit, I start feeling bad. Everyone does. If you don't believe me, look at the pushback of Star Wars when the first character that was revealed was a black dude and the main character turned out to be a girl. Look at all the pushback from those who were neither black nor girl. Okay? It, it, it's one of those things. Um, you know, and we live in an age with this instantaneous communication. And one of the things that I like are self-insertion stories about kids. Okay? Um... You can fight me all day if you want to, but Avatar The Last Airbender is my favorite cartoon of the past 20 years um, because it showed that kids aren't something to overlook. And this is something that ranges real deep with me going all the way back because I was a smart kid and it turned out I was a lot braver than even I knew. Um, but I was always discounted because of my age. You know, I didn't know what I was talking about because I was a kid. Forget the fact that I read eight books on the subject over the, over the summer. I was a kid, therefore I didn't understand. Um, you know, and I was a kid, therefore I was weak. Um, my friends and I did all that stuff because, you know, we were kids and evidently we were weak. We were less than because we were born, you know, because, because our moms decided to have sex with our fathers a little too late, we didn't really have any credibility. So when it comes to stories about kids that save the world, that's huge, you know, because kids did it, especially when it comes to kids saving the world and growing up slowly, i.e. staying kids, you know. And when it comes to um, other things that are like um, coming of age stories, I take those in stride. But I really like stories that focus on kids being kids, not having to grow up too fast like I had to. You know, um, kids not having to grow up or not having to be adults. And sometimes when I do want my nostalgia, I look at stuff that talks about my childhood, which there's a lot more of it now than there was when I was growing up. Um, but when science fiction really goes out there like with doctor who or torchwood or star trek or um star wars to a point um when it comes to things like valerian and battlestar galactica and lost in space and the plethora the literal plethora of movies that came out in the 70s try to capitalize on star wars um, anything that has a new world to explore, new cultures to explore, that's written well, that's written without the tropes of your society was broken until we got here. That's very colonizing and opposed to we can live, um, yeah, we can live currently in harmony. Like your culture is valid. My culture is valid. Let's combine the two and make some stuff, you know, because that's the kind of world I want to live in. So that's the kind of media that I like to that I like to take in. So Lost in Space is about a family that goes on adventures. It was it was based on um, the Swiss Family Robinson, which was a series of books 
about a family that got marooned on an island and they had to survive on the island and stay a family. Cool. You know, uh, most deep dive sci-fi is based on old literature. I don't want to say classic, but old literature. And most of the we're going out into space stuff is based on um, maritime stuff, you know. Um, so Swiss Family Robinson, they were literally called the Swiss Family Robinson as an homage to Robinson Crusoe, which was a story about a dude that got marooned on an island by himself and had to survive. And, um, you know, so it was a family. Like, let's put this family on this on this island. But as the 50s and 60s came around, the space race started. We landed on the moon. There was a whole lot of stuff that went on in between Sputnik and Apollo. Read the history books. Google is free. Um, that turned our eyes to the stars. That opened up our entire culture's mindset to there's something more than this planet. Okay. Now, that, that revelation right there. That's huge, okay? Um, when you grow up, especially in traumatized circumstances, when you're from an abusive home or a bad neighborhood or combinations of all those things, people's brains tend to go two places. They tend to lose their wonder and only deal with what is, or their imagination explodes out of their head, leaving a great big mess all over the walls when it comes to what could be, okay? I went the second way, as you guys don't really need me to explain. Um, I'm the youngest of four, and of my brothers, all, all boys, all boys, um, I ended up, you know, getting friends that were close enough to be adopted as family members, so that's how I got my sisters. So if you guys see me talk about my sisters, that's what I mean. And this happened at a young age, and we're still friends to this day. Um, one of the big things that one of my brothers was into was comic books, and he loves Marvel comics to a point, okay? Um, Daryl McMasters of Run DMC, he's DMC, as in Daryl Mick, um, also loves Marvel comics, okay? And here's the thing. There are two literary concepts that I talk about a lot. Um, one is called um, cathartic motivational and aspirational. These are the two types of heroic stories that there are. Marvel comics are masters of cathartic motivational characters. In fact, in media right now, we are in a time of cathartic motivational characters now yes i've said that haven't defined them okay well understand catharsis is an understanding and a release of pent-up emotions or ideas and motivational is something that would inspire to action okay um therefore a cathartic motivational character is a release of pent-up stuff that motivates someone to do things. In modern parlance, we call this street level. These are street level heroes. These are your Spider-Mans, your Luke Cages, your Daredevils, your Batmans. Okay, these are fictional characters who get one unrealistic trope. They get hyperintelligence, they get super money, they get they get something that a regular person couldn't attain just for um, story elements, but everything they do is very down to earth. And Marvel mastered this because they've been doing it for longer than anyone else in the market. Okay, um, Stan Lee made it very clear that Marvel Comics are based in New York City because their offices are in New York City. And they wanted the readers to feel like, if they looked up at that skyline, they could possibly see Spider-Man swinging across there. If they walked into Harlem, they might find the barber shop that Luke Cage works at. If, if they go into Clinton, which is a real place, um, and they talk to someone, they might be able to tell the stories of the devil of Hell's Kitchen, you know? Um, and as far as the top level, 
as in the most unrealistic of the cathartic motivations, we've got our Batmans and our Ironmans. Really rich dudes with a whole bunch of technology that's not too far ahead of what we got now. I mean, an arc reactor, that's way, way in the future, okay? That's practically cold fusion. Um, but a suit of armor is plausible. A suit of armor with a jetpack is also plausible. You, you, you see what I mean? And Batman is a rich guy with a cool car that has a whole bunch of gadgets that actually exist. You can buy a grapple gun. You can buy smoke bombs. Um, you can train in martial arts. The unrealistic part about um, Batman is money. So much money. We're talking like Jeff Bezos matter of money. And it's old money. Old money. Okay, this is why a lot of people of color can't quite see themselves as Batman because there is no old black money. There is no old Latino New England money. You know, I mean, we're talking Mayflower Club money and that's the world that he runs in. But he walks our streets. You know, he walks the streets where there are gangs and there are drugs and there are organized crime and there are people with 45s. Not super laser cannons, but... um. But a 40, like a freaking Beretta, you know, <laughs> his family was killed with a 38, you know, yeah, Batman's family was killed with a 38, um, pistol. That was it. A uh, 38 long nose pistol. That's what, um, Martha and Thomas were shot with in an alley <laughs> and we got alleys. There are 38 around everywhere. Everybody had a 38. So that's, that is relatable and with that motivation batman is doing something to reach catharsis to let go of that spider-man is struggling with money and he is struggling with money because he's doing the right thing and he's not um capitalizing on what he could do with his powers but he's doing the right thing for the little guy and people like that i mean that's the age that we live in right now because the world is on fire and no one is happy i get that and the idea of waiting for someone to save us isn't really big, you know. But taking these characters, like, I could be like Spider-Man. I could be like Daredevil. I could be like Batman if I trained hard enough. I get that. I get that. Um, aspirational heroes. On the Marvel side, we've got Captain America. Um, he's my favorite aspirational um, Marvel character. Um, Cyclops is up there too. These are people who are paragons of something. These are good people that no matter how bad the world gets, they stay good. Like Superman. No, the world can't touch them, but Superman isn't Superman because he has all these powers and no one can touch him. That's only half the story. The other half of what makes Superman Superman is that Clark is too good a person to take over the world with the powers that would allow him to take over the world. He just wants to help people. And Grant Morrison said that, you know, he's a god that will show up. <laughs> and I like that idea. I like the idea. Um, well, um, Lindsay Ellis, the best video essayist on all of YouTube, quoted an old professor and no I don't have it in front of me I just like I said I didn't do any research for this one I almost didn't get out of bed today um but this guy said that power doesn't corrupt power reveals if you want to know what a person is really like or what they really want to do you give them enough power to do whatever they want and they will show you who they are and I believe that, you know, not just believe, I observe that. You give someone infinite power and, oh boy, um, we will see what they do with that infinite power and that will actually determine um, what kind of a person they really are, you know? Are they the type of person that would help people? Are they the type that would hurt people? You know, what, what type of person are they? And this is a really big thing for me. That, that's a huge thing for where I come from because I come from a place where people don't have much power and okay? that that's that's something that's really um what is the term that's something that's really real you know 
Um, there are lots of arguments and stuff about school lunches and funding for disenfranchised places. And I come from one of those disenfranchised places. You know, during the riots, people are like, why are they burning their own stuff? And they would not listen to the fact that it wasn't ours. We didn't own those stores. We weren't even welcome in those stores. We were required to buy something within 40 seconds or the cops would be called, you know? Um, so we grew up, I grew up in a place that I didn't choose to live. <laughs> I didn't choose to be born in the ghetto. I would have been born in Bel Air or Palos Verdes, you know, either with mansions or horses. That's where I would have chosen to be born if I had a say. Actually, I was born in Beverly Hills, but then they took my body, my little baby body home to Watts. <laughs> and, um, yeah. Um, so we didn't have much agency. I didn't get to pick the school that I could go to. And when I finally could, by the time I reached junior high, the schools that I could pick from were maybe one or two tiers higher, but not like there. It literally was about a 10 tier difference with quality of education based on the resources that they did or didn't have. Okay. Um, so I chose, I made the best choices I could out of what I had to choose from, but when you have to choose between a poop sandwich and a poop sandwich with avocado and you're complaining about eating poop, um, when people tell you, well, you chose the one with avocado, you want to punch them in the mouth. Okay. Um, so when it comes to that, we always look for something better. We look to the God that would show up. We look to the characters that stayed good, that believed in good. You know, um, kids believe in Santa Claus because if they're good enough, then someone will show up from really far away to reward them for their goodness. Um, and I went to the imagination side hardcore with my aspirational desires because I had to imagine better. You know, I had to imagine that we were, that we could live in a system, we could live in a world where these weren't the only things to choose from, okay? Um, and as I've become older, become more of an adult, these things have gotten even more complicated. And as I learn more about them, the more entangled these webs become. Where when I look at science fiction, Sometimes the webs could be intertangled, and sometimes they could be just simple. Um, now, there are some downsides to sci-fi. I ain't gonna lie about that, okay? There are some downsides. Um, sci-fi fans are special. They really are. Um, and one of the things I try and do, especially with this channel, is to remind people to not impose their perspective on everyone else and there's a difference between sharing and imposing okay um, I do what I can not to use definitive statements okay um, at least I, I try to only use definitive statements when I am defining something and in our current discourse in at least the United States in March 2020 we tend to conflate our feelings and our preferences to the whole of reality, okay? Um, every story is complex. Every single story is complex. At least every single good story is complex. And when I say good, I mean, I mean crafted with high quality, okay? Um, stories that try not to leave, that leave as few loopholes as possible, as few plot holes as possible. Um, stories that give you an understanding of their characters because of what's written on the page and not what you have to project into them. All right. Um, that's a huge thing. Um, and these things are complex. A great example is the Game of Thrones up to season five and in the books. Those are good stories. Those are complex stories. They're compelling and there's not just one point, you know, you can, I mean, one of the essences of that story is point of view. So your opinion of things happening is all depending on the lens by which you observe it. That's big for me. That I, I love that idea. Um, 
And a lot of people make the mistake of presenting the lens that they see things through as the only lens there is. And we do this nowadays because America screwed up in the 70s and 80s. It, it really did. It screwed up. It overcorrected in a lot of ways in the 90s. And now everyone is insecure. Everyone has damage. Everyone needs therapy. That includes therapists. Um, yeah, I just made a definitive statement and I'll back it. I really will. Um, we are very emotional and most of the emotions that we feel currently are fear. We have this fear based on the ways that we were treated in school, by our peers, by our employers, and by all public servants that we are inconsequential. Okay? We have no impact on the world around us and any pain we go through, well, that's our fault. No one can help. Um, any any way that we think, no, you're wrong. And since you made an improper calculation, you're a terrible person. So shut up. Everything comes down to shut up, shut up, shut up. And the under one of the main underlying themes that I see is shut up. Like you need to shut up so that I don't feel bad about who I am. And that's how we interact with each other nowadays, you know? So I look to science fiction. I look toward the future. I look toward a future where um, people can see that there's more than one perspective. You know, I came across this when I was young um, and understand I didn't learn how to drive. At least I didn't legally learn how to drive until I was 30. And I had to catch the bus all over California. Um, especially Southern California, me and public transportation or, you know, a lot of my friends are frustrated when I drive because I don't use maps because I know my way around. And if I get lost for half a second, I can get straightened out because I understand, you know, civil engineering and city layout and all that stuff. And I did that by walking the streets and catching public transportation. And one of the things I learned was that there isn't a singular bus route to get to a singular place or more to the point, there isn't a singular path that people can take to a location. There's always multiple ways to get somewhere. Some are easier than others. Um, some are more accessible than others. But there's more than one. And if you don't believe me, go to the place that you go to most, be it your library, your game store, your video store, your grocery store, your coffee shop, and just take a different route. You know, take a different route. If you live in a rural area and there's only one road, that's cool, but I bet you can find a way through the forest. And, you know, there's always taking a helicopter and skydiving in. You know, there's always multiple ways to get to one place. There's always multiple ways to solve problems. And the ways that we've come to communicate with each other in this day and age is... The solution that I am most comfortable with is the only one that I am willing to entertain the existence of. I see it this way, therefore that's how it is. I interpreted what you said maliciously, therefore there is malice in your heart. I don't care what you tell me, I'm telling you that you have malice in your heart. And all that does is close down communication. And we don't communicate anymore. So when I run my sci-fi games and look at what sci-fi I'm going to ingest and not just produce, I think about a world that might work a little better, just a little better than the one that works this way. Or sometimes I destroy the world that we're in. I destroy it entirely, like at the beginning of Titan AE. And I juxtapose the ways that we look at things against a larger picture, you know? And I can do that. I can do that in science fiction. Um, the second problem that science fiction has on a public scale, though, is a lot of people only have a partial education in science, and they use that partial education in almost a religious manner. 
Um, one of the things I stay away from is time travel. Not because I don't like writing time travel. I don't like people reading <laughs> time travel. Um, because everyone thinks they know how time travel works. I'm going to let you guys know something. I got a degree in physics. I don't know how time travel works. You know why I don't know how time travel works? Because no one's ever done it. No one's done it. No one's documented it. No one has written out how it was done and no one has repeated it. It is all theoretical. And since it's all theoretical, that means that in the realm of writing fiction, the only thing, only thing that is important is if what you are writing in regards to that fiction is consistent with itself. It doesn't have to be consistent with what we think we know about the world, okay? That is so important. I don't know how time travel works, okay? I wasn't that good a student. <laughs> um, and I've never traveled through time with this body, okay? I do with my imagination all the time, but all I'm doing is speculating and remembering and remembering my speculations. That's it, okay? But people want to argue that time travel is or isn't. And what I hear, and please correct me if I'm wrong, is that they prefer the way that they see these concepts working. And since the story that's there doesn't already line up with what they prefer, they are unwilling to give any other part of the story a chance. This is what I go into when it comes to nitpickers. So, um, and there's a difference between watching this makes me feel like I don't matter, like I don't exist, like I am other, and watching this makes me not comfortable because they're, they're using a concept in fiction that doesn't line up with what I believe is true, though it's never been done or proven. You, you, you see what I mean? Um, and again, it, it's, it's a really big thing. Like one of my favorite shows, um, when I was growing up, of course, you guys know I'm a Whovian, you know, I'm classic Dr. Who, I'm that guy. Um, but I also loved Quantum Leap, loved Quantum Leap. Um, you know, especially since it handled time travel on a tiny scale, it was time travel plus the butterfly effect. And they were nice shows where the good guys were good. And they were trying to make sure that good guys didn't go bad. I'm with that. Cool. I'm fine. That that's let's watch that story. You know. Uh, <laughs> but yeah, that that that's a really big thing. But I hope you guys have a better understanding of why I chose the shows to review that I chose. Now I'm putting this out there because I'm gonna put up a Twitter poll on whether or not you guys think I should continue with Lost in Space. And here's the thing, <laughs> here is the thing. I want everyone to qualify their yes or no, okay? Should I continue with Lost in Space? Yes, no. I don't wanna know why your answer is yes or answer is no. I would like to know, well, if your answer is yes, I'd like to know why. And if your answer is no, I would like a suggestion on what to do instead. Okay? That's what I would like. This is this is your guys' time. Of course, the patrons get get first crack. Um, but that doesn't mean I don't want to listen to you guys. Okay? I would love to have these conversations about things that you're more invested in, but I'd also like to really have these conversations and I don't want to just chase what's hot. It's one of the reasons that we're not talking about Picard right now. Um, but that's a thing. That's a thing. So, you know, you guys let me know that stuff. But what I'm going to do, there we go, is, um, yeah, I'm going to call today a day. Okay. And I want to thank you guys for being out here. I want to thank, you know, the people that I didn't actually get around to saying what's up to, but I am right now. And by that, I mean, I gotta say what's up. I gotta give my hello hellos to 
in Peace City. Don't think I didn't forget about, don't think I forgot about you guys. And I want to make very clear that I have not forgotten about the three main people that make these shows possible. We're talking about our highest paying patrons. Um, <clears throat> that would be Queen Shannon Lay, His Majesty, Mr. Paul David Mansfield, and of course, our biggest ace in the hole, Jennifer Kroll. But with that, I want to say if you guys want to know how to do all that stuff and how to be involved in what we do, hit up our, you know, hit up our thing. And if you guys want me giving you guys shout outs in this stuff, that's easy. Actually, let me see. Me, 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 me. Yeah, 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 yep. Yep, that's that's one of the things. Um, all you got to do is head over to back in the deck or Patreon dot com slash back in the deck and join um join our patreon become a decker if these discussions are cooler like really cooler than oh i don't know a big bag of chips or a couple of cupcakes you know way cooler than a cup of coffee actually nothing's cooler than a cup of coffee to me right now but um yeah if you think that we are worth more than a cup of coffee a month sign up and become a decker like our newest decker chasing tv and yeah i know you're there and i and i appreciate you being there um at a buck a month um i give shout outs to everybody um at the queen or at the royalty tiers and when i say shout outs i mean i give shout outs <clears throat> on every single show that we produce and all the shows that back in the deck actually funds so you know and of course we've got like five or six shows so that is that's a big thing so yeah head on over there and a lot of you guys don't really like hearing um you know you guys really don't like watching the talking head and all that stuff or you guys are working and i get that um so what i have you do as you guys see boom head over to soundcloud soundcloud.com slash bid underscore p and download our archive um you guys can listen to that for free i actually pay a decent amount of money per year out of the patreon to make sure that everyone has access to the audio for all of our stuff as fast as i can upload it and you can download it and keep it forever as as my gift to you um because well you guys do mean that much to me and i want to make sure like i'm in this for more than money i mean money helps because i gotta pay bills but i'm using this model which is not very profitable because i'm not chasing what's hot I'm not doing many hot takes, and I'm really trying not to do anything on hate. I'm trying not to do, oh, this sucks, and I'll tell you why. No, 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 no. Even when I say that stuff is terrible, what I like to do is I talk about how it can be better. Because right now we live in a time where everyone is talking about how things suck, but they're not proposing any solutions other than shut up and don't look. And that's, that's, not, that's not how we do it here. Okay, that is not how we do it. We Deckers have lived under that yoke for the entirety of our lives. <laughs> so we're like, no, we think that stuff could be better this way. Not perfect, just a little better. All right, so, you know, um, so the patrons really help keep us going. But again, I do this because I want to build a real community. I want to build a community of people that aren't afraid to share their ideas, that aren't afraid of publicly being nerds um, so that we can be a safe haven for those that are in school um, that are 10 year olds and 12 year olds that honestly are afraid to talk about the fact that they want to play Dungeons and Dragons or that they like playing with dolls or that they like science fiction I put us together to be a safe haven for them you know so that when people call them weird and all that stuff they can come to us and we you know kind of like the b girl and the blind melon video for no rain i'm putting this up on youtube today so i'm not going to show it but yeah you know we're here for the b girl we're here for the fat kid we're here for you know we're here for that one black kid in the all-white private school we're here for the latina that's got to work two jobs to support her family and nobody around can actually understand why she likes the silly stuff that she does when she's not working her fingers to the bone. That's what Deckers are. These are what, that's what Bid P is here for. And 
Again, I could come up with a hundred better profit models, but that's not why I'm doing this. So, you know, help us out, um, give us any ideas, and let people know what's going on. But if you guys want to talk to me directly or let me know what you think, because I do not argue publicly, okay, I don't do stuff for spectacle. So if you want to have a real discussion, um, then pull up your keyboard and type in back in the deck at gmail.com. That's B-A-C-K-I-N-T-H-E-D-E-C-K at gmail.com. And you can always hit us up on Instagram or send us direct messages through our Twitter, both.com slash back in the deck. Join the group, Deckers on the Book. If you guys are one of us and you want to show the stuff you made or um, talk about the games that you like or even ask questions about the games that you're interested in or the TV shows that you might want to watch or, you know, because, you know, you might not like sci-fi, you might like fantasy, you might like horror and all that stuff. We cover the board. We cover the gambit. So, you know, there will be people to talk to about stuff like that. Just join the book. Um, join the group Deckers on the Book on that wretched hive of scum and villainy called Facebook. And, um, of course, hit us up on Patreon and help us keep the lights on. So with that, I'm going to say thank you guys for popping in. And never forget that if anybody tells you that you can't like what you like because of the circumstances of your birth, be it race, religion, creed, gender identity, sexual orientation, your disabilities, or your budget, you just tell them that we said to take those cards and put them back in the deck. This is Solar Gray, the cinematic sorcerer, saying thank you guys for this very special episode of Buster Recap. Join us tomorrow on the dark side of the room where we talk about probably something else just as personal. Thank you guys and we will see you guys later.